is now 20 to 12. I don't think I'll go beyond 12, 15. If you're using one of these, make sure there's no sound. If you're not using it, make sure it is turned off so that there's no disturbance in the house of God. God always deserves reverence, whether you're in a church or in the supermarket, but particularly in a house dedicated to the worship of God. Favor number two, while I'm speaking, pray for me and say, oh, right over here, my brother, right here, right here. Right there, my sister. There we go. All right. Favor number two, while I'm speaking, pray for me and say, Lord, put your words in that man's mouth. Jeremiah chapter one, verse nine. Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said unto me, behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. And as surely as God lives, I really want to speak his words. And favor number three, think as you listen. Isaiah 1.18, come now, let us do what? Reason together, saith the Lord. Let me also welcome those of you online, wherever you are. We're grateful you've joined us, and may the Lord bless you with a similar abundance to the way we believe he will bless us in this house. Let's bow our heads. <clears throat> Loving Father in heaven, we come to you today, God, as we've come every day of this series to seek your favor to seek your blessing, to seek your spirit. As we bow before you today, God, if we've sinned against you, forgive us. Grant us your spirit that he may guide our minds into truth. Father, be with me particularly, and I say particularly because my burden is to deliver the words of life and I am made of dirt. Grant me an extra measure of your spirit, dear God. Let him possess my mind my mouth, my body, every faculty required to deliver this message, I place it under the control of your spirit. Bless those online, dear God. Bless this country and all countries represented by those watching. Father, speak clearly through me, I pray, and let no decisions be made to serve you. Heal the sick, I pray. In Jesus' name, let God's people say, Amen and amen. Let's learn something about Jesus. Let's go to John 13. We shall read from verse 13. Dying for life or dying to live. John chapter 13. We'll read from verse 13. And I read from the King James Version of the Bible. Do you have that? We have to move fairly quickly today because of the packed activities that lie ahead of us. Ye call me Master and Lord, and ye say, Well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, ye also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that ye should do, as I have done to you. The key word in verse 15 is example. Jesus gave us an example of humility, and he said that ye should do as I have done unto you. Christ did it, we must do it the same way he did it in his human condition. Let's go to John 15. Dying for life, dying to live. John 15, verse 12. The Bible says, this is my commandment, that ye love one another how? As I have loved you. Here again, we have an example set by Christ. You must love one another the way I, in my human condition, have loved you. And so we have Christ being the example, and I keep saying, in his humanity. Because he took our condition and he lived a life as an example for us. Let's go to First John chapter 2. Let's read verse 6. 1 John chapter 2, verse 6. That's towards the back of the Bible. He that saith he abideth in him ought himself also so to walk, even as he walked. The Bible says, if you say you're a child of God, you ought to live the way Jesus lived when he was on this earth. So we have the humility of Christ. As an example for us, we have the love of Christ. 
as an example for us. We have the lifestyle of Christ as an example for us. Let's go to John 17. We read verse 22. John 17 verse 22. This is Christ praying to his father. And the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them, that they may be one. How? Even as we are one. We come now to the issue of unity in the church. The unity in the church should be a reflection of the unity between Christ and the Father. What I want you to notice, humility, love, oneness, you name it. We have been given a standard that is divine even though we're human. If I said that clumsily, let me try again. God does not give human standards for human beings. God gives divine standards for human beings. That's why Jesus says, this is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. Christ is our example in everything in his human condition. Now, having said that, let us go to Matthew 3. Matthew 3, we'll read from verse 13. We'll examine the baptism of Jesus Christ. We're having a baptism shortly. Remember I said, or the Bible says, that Christ is our example in everything. In his human condition. Matthew 3, reading from verse 13. Then cometh Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be baptized of him. But John forbade him, saying, I have need to be baptized of thee, and comest thou to me? And Jesus answering said unto him, Suffer it to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill how much righteousness? All righteousness. Then he suffered him. And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straight away out of the water. And lo, the heavens were opened unto him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Let's see how that applies to us. Now the Bible says, Jesus, when he was baptized, verse 16, Matthew 3, went up straight away out of the water. And lo, the heavens were opened unto him. And the Spirit, he saw the Spirit of God like a dove descending upon him this happened after he was baptized are you with me we're looking at christ as an example let's go to acts chapter 2 we'll read 37 and 38 dying for life dying to live acts chapter 2 verse 38 in this chapter peter has preached the powerful sermon on the day of pentecost and in verse 37, the Bible says, Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. So Peter said, Get baptized, you'll receive the Holy Ghost. What happened to Jesus? After he was baptized, what happened? The Holy Ghost came upon him. Why? Because in his baptism, Jesus Christ was an example to us. Go to the book of Acts chapter 19. Acts 19. We read 5 and 6. In this chapter, Paul finds 12 unnamed disciples at Ephesus. He inquires about the basis for their baptism. And they inform Paul they had never heard of the Holy Spirit. Well, how can you baptize fully if you've never heard of the Holy Spirit? So Paul taught them additional information. When they heard this, verse 5, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands upon them, what happened? The Holy Ghost came upon them. And so we have Jesus was baptized, the Holy Ghost came upon him. We have Peter telling his listeners, get baptized and the Holy Ghost will come upon you. We have 12 disciples in Acts 19, baptized by Christ, the Holy Ghost came upon them. Those who are being baptized today, you have to believe that after you're baptized, 
Not that you don't have a measure of the Spirit now. I'm not suggesting that. But there's a special gift of the Spirit that will be given to you immediately after you're baptized, whether you feel it or not. Because the working of the Spirit does not always include feeling. Let's go back and look at the baptism of Jesus. The Bible says, and Jesus, when he was baptized, Matthew 3, 16, went up straight away out of the water. Now he went up. In other words, he had been down in the water. This is essential to understand biblical baptism. When I was a little boy, I was a Catholic. And I was christened. Now christening, as a Catholic, a little baby is held in the hands of a mother or father. And the priest pours a little holy water on the baby's forehead. And that is supposed to take the place of baptism. But that cannot take the place of baptism because one condition for baptism is repentance. And so Peter told the crowd, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ. But in order to repent, you must be aware of the sins you've committed. And no baby can be aware of a sin. And so christening, and I speak with respect, is absolutely unbiblical. Jesus was not christened. Jesus was baptized. He knew what he was doing. He chose it. And so the Bible says he came up out of the water. What's the example for us and what does that mean? Let me pray, then I'll continue. Father, continue to grant me your spirit and your words, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Go to Romans chapter 6. We'll read from verse 1. Dying for life. Dying to live. The book of Romans chapter 6. We'll read from verse 1. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Christ were baptized into his death. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death. What does Paul mean by buried? When Jesus went down in the water, symbolically, he was buried. What was he burying? The old life. Not his life of sin. He never sinned. But he took our sins. And so symbolically, Jesus Christ was burying the old life. Now the Bible says that we are buried with Christ in baptism unto death. That like as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Now look at the expression. I'm looking at verse 5 of um, Romans chapter 6. Even so. We should rise to walk in newness of life. The life Christ lived is the life we're to live. Baptism symbolizes the burying of the old life. Another word for that is death. Let's read again Romans 6 verse 3. Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Christ were baptized into his death. Now Christ died to make salvation possible. We must die to benefit from that salvation. Let me say that again. Jesus Christ had to die as payment and penalty for sin in order to make salvation possible. We now, to benefit from his death, we must die that then we may rise to live his life and so paul says as so many of us as were baptized into christ were baptized into his death now the same paul adds some information in galatians chapter 3 verse 27 go there with me galatians 3 verse 27 keep in mind that paul said those of us who were baptized into christ are baptized into his death meaning the death to the old life and the old life that christ died to the sins he took our sins not his now in Galatians 3 27 Paul says for as many of you has been baptized into Christ will have put on Christ mm. Romans 6 verse 3 you're baptized into Christ you're baptized into his death Galatians 3 27 you're baptized into Christ you have put on Christ 
because when you get rid of your life, you need a new one. What's our subject? Dying to live or dying for life. You die to the old life in order to take on the new life because no human being can live two lives at the same time. What did Jesus say? No man can serve two masters. No human being can live two lives at the same time. You either live the life of sin or you live the resurrected life of Jesus Christ, which is a life of victory. Yes, you'll make occasional mistakes, but sin shall no longer be your master. And so Christ died. We must die. But that death is not something inflicted upon us. Now I said Christ is our example. When Christ died, let me put it this way, Christ was not killed. He gave up his life. There's a world of difference between the two. Jesus Christ was not killed. He was crucified but not killed. He gave up his life and he said he would. John chapter 10, verse 18, no man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it up again. That's what Jesus said. He gave his life. He was not killed. His life was not taken. He gave his life now. How is that an example for us? We must give up our life of sin. And having given his life, he rose triumphantly. That resurrected life of Jesus Christ. When we give up our lives of sin, when we die to that old life, through faith in Christ, we rise to live a resurrected life. And so the baptism of Jesus Christ is an example for us. Let's look at his baptism again and see what similarity we can find. Let's go back to Matthew 3. We read verse 13. Matthew 3, reading from verse 13. Then cometh Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be baptized of him. But John forbade him, saying, I have need to be baptized of thee, and cometh thou to me? And Jesus answering said unto him, Suffer it to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Jesus said, this must be done because it is an expression of righteousness. And so Jesus said, suffer it to be so now, for thus it becometh us, it is the right thing to do. It becometh us. Who is us? The person being baptized and the person doing the baptizing. It was right for John to baptize Jesus. It was right for Jesus to be baptized. Today, it will be right for Pastor Prince Lou to baptize you. And it will be right for you to be baptized. As it was with Christ, so it must be with us. His baptism is an example for us. And so we go back to Romans 6, verse 5. Dying to live, dying for life. Romans 6, verse 5. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Now, let's look at that closely. If we have been planted, meaning buried, the way he was, we shall rise the way he rose. Now, Jesus died for us, for our sins. And I said earlier, to benefit from that death, you and I must die to benefit from the death of Christ. Listen to the words of Christ talking about his death. Revelation 1 verse 17. Revelation 1 said, When I saw him, I fell at his feet as, as dead, and he laid his right, upon, her right hand upon me, saying unto me, What? I am he that was dead and is alive now jesus said i was dead not in a coma not unconscious he was dead many of us we don't really die to sins we may be in a slight coma we may be slightly knocked out we're not dead 
Jesus Christ was dead. And in order for us to benefit from that death that pays the price for our sins, we must give up our lives completely. I've often said, if you give up your life to God 99%, who controls the 1%? Are you with me? That is why there must be death and there must be burial. Because only dead people are supposed to be buried. And so when Christ went down, it symbolized for us the burying of a corpse spiritually. When you go into that water today, the water has no healing benefit. You are simply obeying a Bible requirement. But you must understand that that physical activity symbolizes in your mind, in your heart. You have died to sin and spiritually the old man is now a corpse. And you've come to bury him symbolically. Then you rise from the water. There's no magic in the water. But you rise faith in Christ. As he rose triumphant, you come from that water symbolically and literally to live a new life. If we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Let me add to that. The carnal mind always wrestles with spiritual truth. When God made Adam, he made him sinless. Adam sinned. Problems came into the world. The gospel is God's method of taking you back to the way it was before Adam sinned. But here's the challenge and the beauty of the gospel. When Adam was made sinless, he did not have a sinful nature. Follow me closely. It must be easy for someone with a sinless nature to live a sinless life. But here is the power of the gospel. The gospel allows someone with the sinful nature to live a sinless life. You say, mm -hmm, because you're nice. Let me say it again. You didn't get it. Adam, in his sinless condition, should have lived a sinless life. A bird with wings and feathers should fly. But a turtle, a frog, an elephant, it makes no sense. The gospel allows you and me who have the sinful nature to live a victorious life. I'm saying all of that to say this. When you come from that water symbolically, you understand as you follow the example of Christ, you are coming out of that water to live a resurrected, triumphant life. Now, I said earlier, does that mean a mistake won't occur? Yes. Does it mean sin will control your life? No. Why? Because you died. You died. And that corpse stays in the water. A new person rises symbolically. Are you following me? A corpse remains buried. A new person rises symbolically to live the life that Jesus Christ lived. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. Look at Romans 6, 6 again. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed. The body of sin might be destroyed. My brothers and sisters, it is possible through Christ to conquer every weakness of the body and the flesh. It is possible through Christ to live a life that amazes angels and pleases God. But you must die. You must not be killed. You must die are you following me jesus was not killed he gave up his life you and i seeing what christ has done for us we give up our lives and we die but we need to understand that god has another side go to jude chapter one what if a person refuses to do this jude, jude chapter one let me pray as you look father as i continue grant me more of your grace and your spirit in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 
It's five after 12. Jude chapter 1 verse 5. I will therefore put you in remembrance, though you once knew this, how that the Lord having done what? Save the people out of Egypt. Finish the verse. Afterward, destroy them that believe not. You need to understand what's awaiting you if you do not take advantage of the sacrifice of Christ to deliver you from sin. Notice the words of Jude 1.5. I will therefore put you in remembrance though you once knew this. How that the Lord having saved the people out of the land of Egypt. Savior. Afterward, destroy them that believe not. God is Savior and destroyer. And both are acts of love. The sinner needs to understand, if I continue my career of rejecting Christ, what's waiting for me? Destruction. Most people want sweet words from the pulpit. And there's a time for sweet words. The gospel sweet words. But the gospel has salvation and destruction. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish. That's hell. But have everlasting life. That's heaven and the new life. The Lord having saved the people out of the land of Egypt. Afterward destroy them that believe not. But the Bible says the Lord is not willing that any should perish. 2 Peter 3 verse 9. In Ezekiel 33 verse 11 the Bible says, Say unto them, As I live, saith the Lord, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn ye, turn ye from your evil ways, for why will ye die? There are people running around Finhook and Katima and Keatman Shoop and Walvis Bay and Swakopman just running after death. And God is saying, why do you want to die? Why? When I have provided all the life necessary for you in the person of my son. Let me go to Isaiah 5. Let me show you how frustrated we can make God. Dying to live, dying for life. And I haven't got much longer to go. So please hang in there with me. Isaiah 1, 5, reading from verse 1. My friends online, I hope you're still with us wherever you are. Who has prayed for me and said, Lord, put your words in that man? Ah, God bless you wherever you are. Just a few hands, about six hands from 600 people. The preacher is in trouble. Ma Isaiah chapter 5, reading from verse 1. Do you have that? Now will I sing to my well-beloved a song of my beloved touching his vineyard. My well-beloved hath a vineyard in a very fruitful hill. And he fenced it. And gathered out the stones thereof. And planted it with a choicest vine. And built a tower in the midst of it. And also made a wine press therein. And he looked that it should bring forth grapes. And it brought forth what? Wild grape. Now Isaiah is singing this song symbolically representing God and Israel. Let's look at the words again. My well-beloved hath a vineyard in a very fruitful hill. The vineyard, the fruitful hill, the fruitful hill is the land flowing with milk and honey, which God chose for the Israelites. It was at the crossroads of the ancient world. God placed them strategically so that by obedience to him, all people crossing would see what a righteous life is like. And they let him down. In a very fruitful hill, and he fenced it. That's the law of God to protect us from sin. And built a tower in the midst of it, the temple. And also made a wine press therein. In other words, God provided all that was necessary now. Having provided all that was necessary, the Bible says, and he looked or he expected it should bring forth grapes and it brought forth wild grapes. And now, O oh, Jerusalem, inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, Judge, I pray you, betwixt me and my vineyard. Now listen to verse 4. What could have been done more to my vineyard that I have not done in it? Let's modernize that. 
and bring it up to today, August 27, 2022, in Vinhook. God is saying to you, what else do I have to do to let you know I love you? And I've provided a means of deliverance from sin. God, is, what else do I have to do? And the simple fact is the omnipotent God cannot do anything else. He's done everything. That's why when a person rejects the gospel, that God who provided salvation will now be a destroyer. Because the sinner has rejected a gift of God which represents everything God has. Why do I say that? Go to Colossians chapter 1, we'll read 16. Colossians 1, 16, I'm closing off, dying for life or dying to live. Colossians 1, reading from verse 16. We're trying to answer the question, what do I mean by God gave everything he had? He held back nothing. By the way, that's an example for us when we give to him. You have Colossians 1.16. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible. Whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him, that's Christ, and for him. All things were created by him and for him. Now, keep this in mind. Go to John 17. John 17. We read verse 9 and verse 10. This is Christ praying. I pray for them. I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me, for they are thine, and all mine are thine, and thine are mine, and I am glorified in them. Go to one earlier chapter, John 16. Let's read verse 15. John 16, verse 15. Are you there? Read with me. All things that the Father hath, come on, are mine. Everything God has is Christ's. Let the Bible sustain that again. Go to Genesis chapter 14. We read from verse 18. Abraham has come back from a battle to deliver Lot, who had been captured by invading armies. Abraham wins the battle, and he comes back with all the loot, delivers all the prisoners, brings them back. Verse 18, Genesis 14. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine, and he was the priest of the Most High God. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of the Most High God. Finish that verse. Possessor of heaven and earth. The Most High God possesses heaven and earth. And Jesus says, Everything the Father has is mine. Now, this is the person the Father sent. The one who owns heaven and earth. Which means... When God gave Jesus, he gave everything. Because when Christ came, he brought all that is his with him. My brothers and sisters, to save you cost God every single thing. Now, we are to be an example like Jesus. To be saved, we must give God, come on, talk to me, every single thing in surrender. Because to give God a partial surrender is to insult the fact he gave us a total gift. Let me say it again. To give to God an impartial surrender is to insult the fact that God gave to us a total gift and held back nothing. That's the measure of his love. And the measure of our love for him must be a total surrender. We give it up. It's not snatched from us. We give it up, but we give it up when we look at that cross and we see Jesus, the one who said, let there be light, dying or giving his life. We see the one who said, I and my father are one. We see him giving up his life. We see the one who said at Lazarus' tomb, I am the resurrection and the life. We see him giving up his life. We see the one who said, which of you convinceth me of sin? The prince of this world cometh and hath nothing in me. We see him giving up his life. For whom? Forget the world. For you. 
And he says to you, I have given all for you. Can you give up all to me that I may give you much more than you've given up? You didn't get that. If you give God a hundred, God responds by giving you a thousand. So what we give to Christ is sin. Are you following me? What we give to Christ is cigarettes, drugs, immorality, pride, selfishness, stinginess, genocide, corruption, bribery. That's what we give him. We have nothing else to give. He gives us love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, all wrapped up in himself. How can you lose? You cannot lose. And so today, Christ is saying to you and to me, give me your life. I will not take it. Give it to me. Because Satan didn't take my life. I gave it up for you. Now you give up your life for me. And so as the candidates go down, they are symbolically saying, I am giving up my life of sin. There's a corpse being buried. I will rise to live the life of Christ. And how will I do that? Because Christ, by faith, will dwell in me. Someone listening to me needs to die in order to live. You may say, but I'm alive now. That's why I can hear you. Yes, you're alive physiologically, but you could be dead spiritually. Let the Bible explain that. Go to 1 Timothy chapter 5. Let's read verse 6. It's already past 12.15. I did not keep my word. I'm glad, I'm glad God is not like that. 1 Timothy chapter 5. Let's read verse 6 and I will close quickly. We have 1 Timothy 5. Let's read verse 6. Listen carefully. It says she, but it means anybody. Are you there? The Bible says, she that liveth, come on, in pleasure, finish the verse, is dead while she liveth. You may be alive physically, but until you have Christ, you're spiritually dead. She or he that liveth in pleasure is dead. There are a lot of dead people in Vinhook. You can't tell because they're running around causing trouble. A lot of dead people in the United States, many more than in Vinhook or Namibia. They're dead people at the White House or the United States government. They're dead people at every governmental entity. They're dead people. Because until someone touches Christ or receives Christ, that person is dead. But Christ came that they might have life. And they, had, they might have it more abundantly. Let me remind you of what I believe you know. In the hustle and bustle of daily life, it is easy for the Christian to forget Jesus Christ is coming back. In 2001, September 11, the United States never expected what happened. And you know what happened if you were alive back then. In 2010, I believe it was, December 26, there was a, a tsunami in the Asian basin somewhere Almost 300,000 people drowned. No one expected it. It came suddenly. In 2010, there was an earthquake in Haiti. Almost 300 people died. There are things that happen unexpectedly. But Jesus said he was coming as a thief. He does not want to come as a thief because this should prepare you and me to receive him and not be surprised. He's coming as a thief, which means most people on the earth will not be ready when Jesus comes. As verily as almost no one was ready when he came the first time. A couple of shepherds were told after he had come, the wise men came to see him after he had arrived. Let that not be the case this time. Christ is coming back. He's not coming back to convert people. He's coming back to take those who have laid down their lives of sin and taken on his life of grace. Today, I invite you to die that you might live. Give up that life of sin for Christ that he may give you his righteous life. God will give you infinitely more in return 
when you sacrifice the life to him. As I said, all you and I can give God is sin and moral filth. What he gives us is his righteous life. And under the direction of the Spirit of Christ, I ask you, is this someone listening to me? Listen carefully. I'm not talking to all of you. I'm talking to a few. Is there someone listening to me? Having heard what I said, you have come to the conclusion, I have not yet surrendered my life to Christ, given up that old life. And I want to make that surrender, give up that old life before I go too far. If there's someone like that, may I see your hand? I want to give up that old life. And I really haven't done it. Let me see your hand. I want to give up that. Ah, keep your hand. Keep your hand. I want to give up that old life. A Christ-like life isn't the kind of suit you wear. It is the heart that you have. I want to. Ah, God bless you. I want to. Ah, God bless you. God bless you. Give up that old life. What I do when night falls and no one's looking. I want to give up that old life. I have to give it up. And I want to give it up. You go so far you can't turn back. I see that hand. I'm going to give you a little thing to fill out so we know who we're praying for. Keep your hands up. Somebody else, I see my brother right here. I want to give up that or life that I may rise in newness of life. My sister right in the front. My brother, my brother giving out the cards right here. There's someone way against the wall. Is there the only one giving out the cards? Just one. We should have three or four. We all are the cards. We need some more cards quickly, and that quickly has a capital Q. Anybody else? You can put your hands down. Let them rest. The call is, I want to give up that old life of sin and accept the life of Christ. He will not take the life. I want to give it to him. The same way Rome did not take the life of Christ, he gave it up. Give up that old life of sin. Die to sin. Come on over, my brother. You raise your hand, raise it again so we can see. Right over here, right over here, right over here. We have some precious souls and we have over in the back. I wish we had more than one person giving out these things. We can do it more quickly. Thank you for your hard work, my brother. We have some right up against there, up there, right up against there. Now if someone can get some to him, we can do it very quickly. I want to make sure everyone gets one of these cards to fill out. Very, very important. So that when I pray, I know who I'm praying for. I'll let you go momentarily. But this is life and death. There's a sister. I believe it is a sister up against the wall. We have another sister up there. Make sure she gets one. I still only have one person giving out these cards. Now, those of you who raise your hands, I won't call you now. When the service is over, Pastor, will the conference room be available? I want you to follow me to the conference room so I can meet just with you and pray for you. Now, I don't want the conference room crowded with 900 people. I'm only asking those who raise their hands so we can have an intimate moment together so I can pray for you. Those of you who raise your hands, bring the cards with you. If they're not finished where you are, we'll finish them in the conference room. Let me talk to all of you. How many of you will say, Father, thank you for your patience with me. I'd like to recommit my life to you right now. Can I see your hand? Recommit my life. I believe you're telling the truth. Stand up with me. Those of you online, make that recommitment. I appeal to you in the name of Christ. Make that recommitment. We eat every day. We do things every day. Let's recommit our lives to Christ every day. The devil doesn't take vacations, nor should we from being vigilant while you're standing we have a baptism in a few minutes listen carefully to me is there someone listening who still needs to make a decision to be baptized you have not yet made it for reasons known to you but you know in your heart and conscience you need to make a decision to be baptized you'd like to make that decision right now raise your hand you have not yet made it you have not yet made it. You'll make it now. Can I see your hand? My sister, all right. 
See, my sister right here, I'm delighted you raised your hands. I really am. Somebody else. I have, ah. Ah, God is good. Yes. Now, I want you to come. Come, come right here. Sister, come. Let my sister pass, please. I'm making a decision for baptism right now. I have not yet made it. You, I want to come with me. The rest of you, meet me in the conference room. But there's a sister coming through. Make sure the way is clear. Somebody else. I'm deciding right now I need to be baptized. Not that you'll be baptized now. You're making the decision now. Come, 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 come. Way up in the top. Come. I'm making that decision right now. Let me see your hand. Right now. I should have made it earlier, but better late than never. Anybody else? A decision to be baptized at the next baptism. Raise your hand. Raise it high so I can see it. Where is it? Come, sister, come. Come. Oh, my brother, God bless you. I need these names. Somebody else. Those of you online, respond to the call in the best way you can because I'm speaking to you as well and so is the Spirit of God. Anybody else? I'm making a decision now to be baptized the next baptism. Raise your hand. If I miss a hand, point it out to me. Do I miss any hand anywhere? So some back here, I can't see them. If you can see them, let them know we'd like them to come forward. All right. Let me pray. You may come while I'm praying. Dear God in heaven, thank you for your long-suffering nature. We thank you, dear God, you're not willing that any should perish. We thank you for those who've answered the call. I want to die to sin and give, my, give up my life that I may take on the resurrected life of Christ. Then those who answer the call, I am making a decision right now to be baptized and to live a life of obedience by the power of Christ. Please, God, for that man, that woman who has not yet made the choice, who is in the valley of decision and who is struggling, what should I do? Tell that man, tell that woman to come and to come right now. And so I pause again, Father, in this call and I ask one more time, 30 seconds. Someone else needs to say, I'm making a decision for baptism right now. Raise your hand. Someone else needs to do that. Raise your hand. I'm deciding right now I'd like to be baptized the next time. Let me see your hand. Come, come, come. God bless you. Come. Raise the hand. Ah, come, come. Right back there. Come. Come. Ah, God bless. Thank God for the spirit. He has not given up. Let God's people come through, please. Come, come, come. 15 seconds. I am making a decision now to be part of the next baptism. Come. Come. Just come. All right, my 30 seconds are up. But keep coming, keep coming. Father, I'm closing the prayer. But keep your mercy flowing like a river. God, give strength to those who answer the call, those in this building and those online, wherever they may be on this earth. Thank you for your word, simple and powerful. Thank you for the example of Jesus Christ in his love, his humility his lifestyle, his oneness with you in every area. He is our example for us and particularly this day in the area of baptism. He laid down his life. We want to lay down our lives of sin. Strengthen those who came dear God and bless the rest of today's activities. In Jesus name we pray. Let God's people say amen and amen. Those of you who answered the call, follow me right now to the conference room.